After my last review, I discovered part of a handwritten message on a ripped up piece of newspaper. I searched through the refuse and discovered it was, indeed, part of a larger message. Never stop reviewing. The form my eternal torment has taken. It certainly would seem that I am doomed to never stop reviewing. Perhaps Tiny Adam West left the message behind for me to find, to instill in me a shred of false hope that maybe this secret note might spell out some way of escaping my fate or prophesize my return to the living and then crush those dreams in an instant when the note's advice is nothing more than what I must already do to avoid worse agony. How utterly disheartening. And yet, I resolve to remain vigilant and to expect the unexpected. This may be desperate, unfounded optimism, but I believe there may be more to this writing than a hellish practical joke. The initials seem overwhelmingly familiar. D.T. Someone from my former life, perhaps? Someone important? D.T. Deanna Troy? Dick Tracy? Dallas, Texas? It could all be an elaborate trick to lull me into a false sense of security. Or, I could be drawing the wrong conclusions about what is really going on here. If only I could remember. But one thing is painfully certain. My jailer or jailers want me to feel like I am becoming Spawn, complete with the green blood, bizarre source of nutrients, living costume, and fragmented memory. The first issue of Spawn the Dark Ages reminded me of those elements as it sets up a familiar situation but in an unusual setting, with a completely fresh and original visual aesthetic. A new Spawn is born in Arthurian times, and Brian Haldwin, now with his own title and working entirely independent from McFarlane's plans and plotting notes, introduces all the rules and traits consistent with the contemporary Spawn story, but he gets a great deal more done in his first issue than most Spawn comics do in five. A war hero dies mysteriously, then returns sometime later in hellish armor to a land more politically corrupt than when he left it. This creature, missing most of its memories, acts on instinct and demonstrates a devotion to justice as he protects the weak from those in power who manipulate and take advantage of them. But he fights the corrupt with equal ruthlessness and without mercy, thirsty for blood. A prologue establishes this story as told by a man drinking in a tavern to a group of men sitting around a fire. One must expect, then, embellishment and exaggeration in a fantastic tale of old, no matter how true the man claims it is. I am curious if this possible unreliability in the narration will become significant as the story unfolds, or if this is Holguin's easy out if any of his lore and mythology fails to match up with pre-established continuity. But I would not be too concerned with that, considering how much pre-established continuity fails to gel with pre-established continuity. There are a few subplots happening simultaneously. The birth of a Hellspawn, a boy called Pevin meeting a mysterious Hagrid-sized brute who gives him an apple and talks with him about the nearby, deserted, ominous, and likely haunted castle, and the evil Baron Rivalin, who rules his land with an iron fist, makes deals with thieves, oppresses and overtaxes the poor, and lives in a big spooky castle with ravens sitting on skull's heads on pikes in case we forgot who the bad guy is. Each of these segments of the story are effortlessly woven together. The apple is significant because we already know how poor and hungry the peasants are, and Ravalin has come to power due to the disappearance of Covenant, the hero knight who would never have stood for his brand of leadership and who becomes Spawn. I get the impression Ravalin was responsible for Covenant's death, which is not stated, but highly implied. Upon Covenant's return is the shirtless and helmeted Hellspawn. He tears apart Dublanc's men. Dublanc, who is Ravalin's right-hand henchman. These men are terrorizing innocent poor countrymen while on a murder investigation. Spawn spares Leblanc, it is unclear as to why, but leaves his pretty face brutally scarred, which it is established he is incredibly vain and proud about. Haldwin does an excellent job of planting clues and paying them off, rewarding the reader for close observation. The mysterious large man with the apple has a green glint in his eye in only one panel, and he tells the boy that if that castle is not haunted, it soon would be, foreshadowing the last page in which he greets Spawn himself at the foreboding castle's entrance. 
He looks to be Covenant's version of Cogliostro in this story, complete with a cane and wide-lit hat. I only hope he is a little more forthcoming right out of the gate. This spawn has not one line of dialogue. We learn about him through his actions and his confusion, but those narrations are not overwritten or eating up precious panel time while serving no story function. I found this an excellent introduction to this world, confidently paced and structured, if not somewhat derivative of other pieces that take place in this period, and with bold, fresh artwork by Liam McCormick Sharp. His drawings provide a blend of straightforward, contemporary comic storytelling with slightly surreal, gothic, but highly detailed pages, which seem to borrow stylistically from 6th century period painting techniques, giving it an unorthodox, distinct aesthetic. And now I must conclude this entry. My jacket is becoming hungry again, and I still await the second arrival of Tiny Adam West, with another supply of the caffeinated nectar I so desperately crave. Signed, Unknown.